Hello, my name is Chris Luce, CSO and co-founder of Frequency Therapeutics. And today I'll be discussing progenitor cell activation. And by that, I mean an approach to activate regeneration of the progenitor cells within the body for a variety of applications focused mostly on hearing restoration. This is in contrast to traditional cell therapy where cells are removed from the body and returned or gene therapy. This is simply reactivating the progenitors within place to perform their native functions. Our story actually began within the intestine, one of the most regenerative parts of the body, where our co-founders, Bob Langer and Jeff Karp, discovered some of the key cues that keep these progenitor cells constantly regenerating, replacing our intestinal lining every four to five days. It was around this time that it was discovered that closely related progenitors existed in the cochlea related to these intestinal cells. And our co-founders proved that the same cues could reactivate these normally dormant cochlear progenitors as a potential way to address hearing loss. As we look at progenitor cell activation more broadly, these types of cells exist throughout the body um, and your body controls them with different signals. So we see this as a broad regenerative platform where we're focused first in the ear and then also discuss work in the brain on multiple sclerosis where we see a range of potential uh, applications and therapies. So how does this look? When there's a, a progenitor in place in a given tissue, often they can be dormant and we develop small molecule or actually small molecule combinations that can activate these progenitors and start asymmetric division, meaning the progenitor will be replicated, leaving behind a copy of itself and creating a new functional cell that can perform uh, and restore tissue uh, structure and function. So just a small molecule approach. Now this has a number of benefits um, relative to, to other approaches in the regenerative field, which, which we think a great deal of. Um, but for instance, with this approach, we're harnessing the native biology. These progenitors are already in the identical position uh, that you hope them to be in, where they need to be to have their effect. There's no cell delivery and integration. Further, there's no changes to the genetics. We're harnessing and turning on the natural genetic programs that had already run earlier during development to restore and reform tissue. And finally, we're just doing small molecule manufacturing, uh, which uh, is uh, much more straightforward than cell and, and gene therapy manufacturing. Now for the bulk of the presentation, I'll focus on the ear and hearing restoration. So I'd like to orient the, the group uh, to this area. And so if we look inside the cochlea here, which I show I've unrolled here, it's really laid out just like a piano with the high frequencies detected right at the start where sound enters uh, the cochlea uh, and lower frequencies further up. And essentially these rows of hair cells shown in the micrograph here are different piano keys that play different notes that you can sense as you're understanding the world around you, particularly speech. Now, unfortunately, when these hair cells are exposed to too much noise or ototoxins, they can be lost. Um, and here's what the damaged cochlea looks like where hair cell loss has occurred. Now, it's important to know that the hair cell loss and the damage is very specific. It really just affects hair cells, but the rest of the cochlear structure remains intact. Nerves are in place and progenitor cells are in place. The cells that gave rise to these hair cells originally exist one for one next to these hair cells. That's preserved. And with many species like birds and reptiles, when this damage happens, they turn on the progenitors, restore hair cells, and within a matter of weeks, they've restored hearing function. Mammals have lost this capability. We have the underlying progenitors, the nerves, and all the systems in order to be able to regenerate, but don't turn on the natural signals to start this regenerative process. And that's the approach with our therapy. It's also been very importantly found that the degree of hair cell loss very much is correlated with the amount of hearing loss that occurs. So hair cell loss really is a driver reinforcing this approach of hair cell restoration as a therapy for hearing loss. And here's what this would look like. Uh, here we were showing our two small molecules that work together to shift the state of the progenitor cell into a mode where it can go through asymmetric division and restore a hair cell while replacing itself by turning on the right genetic pathways in that cell. At a pathway level, uh, we're actually doing a pair of things. So compared to 
Uh, this is showing cochlear progenitor proliferation, activating and getting these progenitors to grow with a single agent, which activates WINT through GSK3 inhibition. We do see a significant um, enhancement of growth and a shift in this curve to the right by adding just that one agent. A second agent, sodium valproate, is an HDAC inhibitor that on its own is epigenetic. It's opening up targets and making these progenitors more responsive but doesn't actually stimulate any growth on its own. The key insight is that when you put the two molecules together, you open up the targets ep epigenetically, and then you activate the right targets, you get these really profound synergies. And this is the key to our approach. It was found first in the intestine on why that system is so active, and it's been found to be very active within the cochlear space. We think about this in terms of developmental, developmental biology. Uh, here I'm showing Waddington's epigenetic landscape. And as a single stem cell starts to differentiate and specialize, uh, you're rolling downhill into these fully differentiated cells. Now, I think the pioneering work uh, by uh, Dr. Yamanaka showing you could take some cells and shift them all the way back with four factors to stem cells uh, was very encouraging. Uh, but for some specific applications, you're then faced with the challenge of how do you make them form only one type of cell and then how would you deliver that cell in the body? Additional people who saw this progenitor cell within the cochlea said, well, what if we could turn on some hair cell genes and try to force the differentiation, a trans-differentiation approach? Uh, but this doesn't necessarily turn on all of the right genetic programs in order to uh, set up for a fully formed hair cell to emerge and can eliminate uh, the progenitor cells that have been converted. Our approach, learning from the intestine and naturally regenerative species, is to signal those progenitor cells through a pair of molecules to move one stage back in development towards a bipotent state where they can replicate themselves and full, form a fully functional, well-integrated hair cell. So just using a pair of small molecules to shift them one stage back in order to really put them into a similar position they were in uh, during the third trimester when you were forming your hair cells naturally. Before I entered the clinic, we did a variety of preclinical tests um, to really validate this approach. First, we were able to obtain human inner ear tissue ex vivo uh, from patients who were having surgeries where their inner ear was removed. And by applying our active agents, we showed that we could both proliferate these inner ear progenitor cells and form new fully formed adult human hair cells. Now this had never been done before and showed that if our pair of drugs got to their target, new hair cells could be created. The next major question was, well, can those hair cells reconnect and have function? And so here we used adult mice with uh, very extreme noise deafening models where hair cells are knocked out. And we showed we could both restore hair cells and improve hearing function across all frequencies. Finally, we've done a great deal of work on drug delivery, showing that we can obtain therapeutic levels of drug in the cochlea in a variety of species using a simple intratympanic injection, uh, which is used for steroids and antibiotics routinely. So we can get the drug to the target, it can activate cells and form new hair cells, and those hair cells have the potential to reconnect and have function. And it was really this preclinical package plus a strong safety package that led us to the clinic. Here's what the product looks like, FX322. It's a liquid containing the two small molecules that is injected intratympanically, as shown here, into the middle ear open air space, and then sets up as a thermoreversible gel. So it turns into a gel in place at body temperature that allows diffusion of, of the active agents into the cochlea. And as you recall from the piano picture, um, the entry point to the cochlea is near the higher frequencies of the cochlea, and this will become important later. So the higher frequencies get bathed uh, within uh, this drug combination. And this is very important because high frequency is where people use, lose their hearing loss first and most commonly. So we've completed a first clinical trial and a phase one, two study that was designed for safety. In this study, we enrolled patients with stable hearing loss, whose hearing had not significantly changed for over six months. It was a 23 patient study and randomized approximately two to one drug to placebo. 
and only one ear was treated. So in essence, there were three forms of control within this study. Patients were historically flat, placebo controlled within the injected ear, and had an uninjected ear as a contralateral control. And there were monitoring patients at 30, 60, and 90 days uh, for safety, for, which included any change in their audiometric performance. Because this was a safety study, we include a number of patients who had mild hearing loss, uh, 14 of the patients. And one of the key metrics is called a word test, where a patient will be read 50 words through a, a, a microphone, uh, which they will then be asked to repeat those words back correctly to show, can they properly understand and repeat back words? It's really a measure of speech intelligibility, which is our most important function related to hearing. And in the mild patients, they typically have better than 45 out of 50 words that they'd score correctly. Uh, and so here what we showed is that there was no significant loss in their ability to perform this function. And also because of the ceiling effect, they had near perfect scores coming into the um, uh, test, 45 or more out of 50 words, there was little room for improvement. So this was really designed for and checked an important safety box for us. However, we did have nine patients that had more significant hearing loss and had significant word recognition score deficits. And of these, six patients were treated with the active agent FX322. All of them had increases in the word recognition scores, and four of these six increases were statistically significant and clinically meaningful. And I'll show them to you shortly. This is, to our knowledge, the first time uh, a therapeutic candidate has demonstrated an improvement in word function uh, in patients with stable hearing loss. There was no change in the untreated ear, as well as no change in the placebo, so it was really closely linked to the treatment with FX322. What I'm showing here is the six patients that had these word deficits that were treated with drug. And here's their starting scores shown in orange. Out of 50 words, they range from seven to 26 words they get correct. After a single injection uh, intertympanically and then measuring performance 90 days later, we saw that the word scores had increased substantially. In fact, more than doubled in many cases. And in this type of test, these are well validated recognized assays where the standard deviation is approximately three words out of 50, and many of these patients had roughly 20 word improvements. And I'll highlight, what does this mean for a patient? Patient two uh, may have been in a cochlear implant candidate coming in, but after treatment has moved out of that range, might be a hearing aid candidate. Patient four came in getting half of their words incorrect, and 90 days after a single treatment are essentially getting all the words correct. Same thing in the final two patients, uh, where while they didn't reach the bar for clinically meaningful improvements, also showed increases in their word score. Um, so this is critical. Patients, once they have lost hearing, once they have declines in word recognition that are stable for multiple months, those scores do not historically improve. It just doesn't happen. Uh, so the historical control, placebo, and untreated ears has uh, led this data to be very encouraging that we're seeing these uh, drug-related hearing signal effects. So we've shown we can get the drug to the target tissue, um, strong safety, a clinical meaning for improvement in hearing recognition and word recognition. Uh, and then finally, we've also brought back uh, some of these patients at between 13 and 21 months after single dosing and showed that three of the four patients who had clinically meaningful improvements maintained a clinically meaningful benefit. So um, this approach is designed to be disease modifying. And I think that's uh, what this data uh, continues to support. We're currently in a phase 2A study where we're looking to further establish this hearing signal. Also, we're looking at the effect of multiple doses in addition to the one dose we ran in this previous study. And we're refining our endpoints and patient populations uh, to prepare for, for future trials. Now, this approach of PCA, um, we think has many applications uh, beyond hearing restoration. And I'll highlight one more of those, and that's multiple sclerosis. Um, the Scripps Institute and Pete Schultz uh, was doing work uh, evaluating whether oligodendrocyte progenitor cells in the brain that are the source of, of myelin and myelination of neurons uh, could be activated with small molecules, very similarly to how we were looking for molecules that could turn on the cochlear system. Uh, they'd found um, a number of classes that could do this, uh, validated in animal as well as these were validated in human clinical studies as published in The Lancet. 
And what we have done is applied our expertise at selecting optimal combinations of agents, and we're moving this forward uh, towards an IND in the second half of 2021. So finally, we've demonstrated that progenitor cell activation by applying small molecules to activate endogenous progenitors to heal tissue and restore function uh, shows a great deal of potential. Um, and uh, we've been most focused on hearing restoration, uh, but we see this having many different uh, applications uh, and see the benefits of having the progenitors already in the right location, turning on the native programs with no genetic changes uh, and just simple small molecule manufacturing and delivery. Uh, and we see this as a, a really a building on in a new wave of regenerative medicine of just small molecule approaches that can be broadly applied. And we're eager to advance our 322 uh, program in hearing restoration, which is currently in phase 2A. Thank you very much.